Bob fixed my pulpit for this week, and so thank you, Bob. I have things at eye level, finally. It's been a big week. <clears throat> I think as our nation has digested and, and started to go on this movement and really taken up, as we've seen around the entire world, not just in our nation, of calling for justice, calling for black voices to be heard, and yet, even in the midst of that, there's still the reports of violence. We see the violence, we see the protests that um, turn and are followed by looting, followed by theft, and or met with brutality from our police forces, and or are met with scorn from neighbors. We see a lot of things on social media right now. I don't think I need to tell you this, <laughs> but it feels like a whole lot of strife. And in the middle of all this, as we are a part of this part of history unfolding, a question that I've been asking, and especially as I've been preparing for this week and in the passage that we're going to read, which is, well, you'll see in a second, the question that I'm asking today, and, and I think many of us are asking, is where is God in the midst of strife? When things feel a bit chaotic, when things feel really uncomfortable, where is God? How do we know what He's doing? Where can we follow Him? How can we discern the Holy Spirit? And I invite you to take those questions and to be asking them as we go through our passage in our scripture for today. And so we're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 22, starting in verse 6. Now we're jumping in right here into the middle of David's story, right? We've been working through his story from the beginning of his introduction in the Bible up through here. And last week, last week he was at the lowest point in life. And what happens here, what happens in this next passage, uh, is happening right in parallel with what we talked about last week. So David's in that cave. David um, is at the lowest depths of despair. And these events that we're about to read are happening right alongside. So, here we are. Starting in verse 6, 1 Samuel 22, we read this. Now Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men who were with him. Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in hand, and all his servants were standing about him. And Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, people of Benjamin! Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? That all of you have conspired against me. No one discloses to me when my son Jess makes a covenant with the son of Jesse. None of you is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait at this day. Then answered Doug, the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul. Uh, I, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob and to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab. And, and he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions and gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Hmm. Let's stop for a moment and consider what we've just read. The veil here has come off. Saul's standing up here on this hill. He's got a spear in hand. And his madness is on full display. Up until this point, Saul has had this burning desire to kill David. And it's kind of flashed up and boiled over at different points. And it's been foolish. And people have tried to reason with him and talk him out of it. But in a sense, it was explainable because this guy is, well, this guy's just a little insecure. You know, he's, he's just kind of that little boy who's insecure. He's, he's having a hard time accepting that, that anyone could get praise except for him. He wants to be the most popular kid in school, but he's not there yet, and so he's just taking it out. 
It's not right, but it's kind of explainable. But now, now we get the full look at the character of Saul. He's paranoid, he's manipulative, and he's irrational. Let's paint this scene. So Saul, Saul's here. He's standing at the top of this hill, probably in a wide stance, something like this. And he's got a spear in his hand for no apparent reason because he's not in the middle of a battle. And even if he was in the middle of a battle, he's usually in his tent. So who knows why he has a spear in his hand now. Maybe he's going to throw it at somebody else instead of David. But he's got all of his henchmen standing around him and he's addressing them. And he starts off, and he starts spouting off this ridiculous conspiracy theory that is concocted in his mind and convinced himself is true. And he's accusing the people standing in front of him, outnumbering him, by the way, of conspiring against him. Apparently, apparently, and this is what Saul's got going on in his mind, David... Right? David, the guy who has been Saul's most faithful servant, even after Saul tried to kill him, David was still his most faithful servant, and who is right now, by the way, living in a cave. Which in biblical terms is equivalent to basically being dead. He's living in a place that is reserved for tombs. And he's trying to simply survive, but Saul has this... this conspiracy theory in his mind that David has infiltrated Saul's inner circle and he's turned all of them against him. You're all conspiring against me. I know it. Are you a little confused yet? Because it gets a lot worse. David isn't even the main bad guy in Saul's little conspiracy theory. No, no, no. David, who's apparently turning all of Israel against Saul and, and, and oh, a whole bunch of other things, is being controlled by Saul's own son, Jonathan. Jonathan is the one who's turned David against Saul. And apparently all of these men in front of him, all of his loyal servants, knew that and didn't tell him. And because of Jonathan, now David is trying to kill Saul, which he's not, and take over Saul's throne. Which again... It's not David's intention at all. And so, in order to win back the loyalty of his inner circle, because trust is clearly not an option in Saul's mind anymore. He can't trust any of them. They're all conspiring against him. And even though they're conspiring, he still wants them on his side, so he bribes them. He gives them the promise of wealth and of positions of power if if only they will divulge the secret plans that Jonathan and David are, are clearly making. Because they obviously know what they are. David's clearly communicated to, the, to them, and they're all in on it. But David's try, Saul's trying to get them back to his own side because Saul has gone completely crazy. But there's no secret plans. And so all of his men are standing there not saying anything because... There's nothing to say. There's no conspiracy. There's no plot to overthrow Saul. <laughs> this is all things Saul in his, in his mind has convinced himself of. But then there's Doug. Oh, Doug. Doug, the outsider, the Edomite the nation that Israel's currently at war with. And so Doug was either captured and enslaved or Doug is a traitor to his own country and is serving Israel. Doug sees his own chance to increase his personal wealth, to be put in a position of power and prestige, and he jumps on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I saw David. Oh, yeah, let me tell you, if nobody else is going to tell you, he was talking to the high priest. And you know what? The high priest even talked to God on his behalf. And then, oh, and then he gave David food and the sword of Goliath. Wonder what he's going to do with that. That high priest guy, well, he's clearly in on this scheme. And he even gave that rebel a weapon to fight you with. Which, well, this fits perfectly with what Saul's been thinking because the priest's Samuel himself had rejected Saul and said, the Lord rejects you. And so obviously that's not true. It's the priests who rejected him because they're conspiring against him. And they're all part of this big conspiracy theory of everything that's going on. 
And Saul's got this mindset of, of the whole world is against me now. I can't trust anyone. Do you see Saul's humanity slowly slipping away? Saul is in his current state unable to love, unable to trust. Instead of Instead of trust, he feels that he has to resort to fear, standing intimidating in front of his men with a spear. He has to resort to intimidation. He has to resort to, manipul- to bribery in order to manipulate people to be on his side because he can't just trust them. He doesn't trust that when his son came to him trying to say, what you're doing is wrong, Saul, that he was doing it out of love. No, he must have been doing it because he was conspiring against me. Saul has completely isolated himself from all community. Though he's standing in the middle of it, though he's king over all of it, he has made himself an outcast in his mind. And clearly, he's unable to reason. Two of those massive marks that when we talk about being made in the image of God, it means to be able to love, to be able to care for creation, to be able to use the faculties that God has given us such that we can be in relationship with each other, with God. And Saul, Saul can barely do any of those. Similar to the man back in Mark chapter 5, if you remember from our spiritual warfare series, that was inhabited by a legion of demons that showed no humanity whatsoever. Saul is about halfway there. Where is God in the midst of all this strife? Well, God, God has let sin expose itself. Because a reminder why Saul's in this position, because Saul rejected God. He broke God's laws. He turned against God, the one whom he was anointed by, so that he could follow his own desire to be popular and to have the praise of the people more than the praise of God. And so in the midst of the strife that we are experiencing right now, when things eh, seem to be pretty chaotic, I've seen a whole lot of conspiracy theories being floated around over the past six months, and it would be, we, could, we could go on for a long time trying to list them. What sin is being exposed What sin is exposing itself is coming to the top. Are we finally seeing the true character in the midst of the situation that we're in right now? A few that I've observed. One, in the midst of a pandemic, we see the sin in our own community, in our own nation, of of our lack of care for the most vulnerable. Look at the people who are the most affected by this pandemic currently. The elderly, the poor, and African Americans. Disproportionately, statistically, this disease has impacted their communities, both economically and their physical health, far more than the broader population. Which is a pretty good indication that we have not done our duty to love our neighbor as ourself. And then in not just the pandemic, but now we are also wrestling with the civil unrest. Showing us, declaring to us that we as a society have not afforded our black brothers and sisters the justice and love that we have committed to <laughs> both as followers of God and as residents of the United States of America. But what else? What else is being exposed? Those are some big ones. Those are some broad ones. 
But what else has this time of strife and of turmoil and a bit of chaos exposed in our lives, in our communities, in our nation? I invite you now to take this time Right over the, while we are still in the midst of it, and as we are co- hopefully coming out of it in the coming months, maybe a year or so, who knows how long it'll last, to ask God to show us. To show us what sin is being exposed, that we may address it. Where is God in the midst of strife? Well, here as we see in the example of Saul and the strife he's putting his nation through, that God is letting his sin to be exposed. But that seems to be more of a passive action, right? Is God actually acting in that? What do we see him actually doing? Well, let's continue on. Let's keep reading. and Let's see what else God is doing in this passage. Starting in verse 11. Then the king sent to summon Ahimelech, son of Ahitab, at all his father's house, the priests who were at Nob, and all of them came to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, son of Ahitab. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread? How dare he give him bread? And a sword, and have inquired of God? For him, so that he has risen against me to lie in wait at this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king, And who among all your servants is so faithful as David? Who is your king's son in law and the captain over your bodyguard and honored in your house? Is today the first time that I've inquired of God for him? No. Let not the king impute anything to his servant or to all the house of the father, for your servant has known nothing of all this, much or little. Eh, mostly true. And the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you in all your father's house. And the king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord, because their hand is also with David, and they know that he fled and did not disclose it to me. But the servants of the king would not put out their hand to strike the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doug, You turn and strike the priests. And Doug the Edomite turned, and he struck down the priests, and he killed on that day 85 persons who wore the linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, he put to the sword, both man and woman, child and infant, ox, donkey, and sheep, he put to the sword. Absolutely appalling. And it's in response to this news of what Doug has done that David writes Psalm 52 and he says, Why do you boast of evil, O mighty man? The steadfast love of God endures all day. Your tongue plots destruction like a sharp razor, you worker of deceit. You love evil more than good and lying more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous shall see and fear and shall laugh at him, saying, See the man who would not make God his refuge, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and sought refuge in his own destruction. Notice in these first two scenes, Saul's servants 
when Saul's spouting off those conspiracy theories about how the whole world is against him and Jonathan, his son, and David, his most faithful servant, are trying to kill him. His servants don't agree with him, but they don't contradict him either, even though they know it's false. And then in this scene, Saul tells them to do something that is absolutely horrifyingly wrong. To slay all of the high priests of God. And they refuse. This time they they do say something. They say, no, I won't do it. They refuse. They don't actively participate in this. But when Saul commands Doug to do it, They are silent. They don't speak up. They don't stop him. They sit idly by as Doug slaughters not just the 85 priests, but the entire city of Nob. Women, children, infants, men, elderly animals, all of them are slaughtered. David's reaction in Psalm 52 is that of righteous anger. It's some really harsh language, stuff that we're not accustomed to reading in the Bible, and especially because we view it through the lens of the cross and know that every single person can be redeemed through Jesus And so to hear David calling someone, you wicked and evil man, God will uproot you from the land of the living, that seems contrary, but it is an expression of the grief and of the anger that he has. Why? Why is David so moved and so grieved? Well, because as we keep reading on in verse 20, But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitab, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doug the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of your father's house. David was not the one who killed these priests. David is not even at fault for this. This is entirely on Saul and on Doug. They are responsible for their actions. But David feels the weight of having occasioned this. He knew the wicked people he was dealing with. And he knew that back in chapter 21, when he, just one chapter ago, when he visited Ahimelech and the priests, when David lied to them about the reason for his visit so that he could get bread and a sword and what he needed to survive and continue his journey, that he had endangered them. He had tried to protect them in a way by lying to them, but he had not told them the truth so that he could benefit from it, so that he could survive. And as a result, they are all dead. Can you imagine? Can you imagine knowing that you occasioned, that you had a part to play in the death of an entire town. And yet David, by his actions, shows himself to be the opposite of Saul. In verse 23, he says to Abiathar, the last remaining priest, the last remaining survivor of that entire town. He says, stay with me. Do not be afraid for he who seeks my life seeks your life. 
with me you shall be in safe keeping. Paul has aligned himself against God. And in the ultimate expression of that, he has ordered and directly been responsible for the killing of God's holy anointed priests. In New Testament terms, Saul would be very much called an antichrist. Or as David shows himself to be a Christ-like figure in saying, I am taking responsibility even though I am not at fault. I will seek to be part of the solution. I will take care of you, Abiathar. Stay with me. And so David takes in the man of the priests, the descendants that God has chosen to be his royal representatives and mediators between the people. Oh, man. Apply that to today. Apply that to today as we hear our black brothers and sisters calling out a system that has repeatedly beaten them down. And though we may not be the ones who have directly implemented the system, yet we still have a part to play. We, more than likely, if you're listening to this, this recording, right, we're a pretty small church, I know just about all of you and everyone who will be listening to this, you did not directly cause the death of George Floyd. You've not perhaps directly done an act of racism explicitly, yet we have benefited from that system. That is what the voices of our black brothers and sisters, that's what our sister church, those whom we worship with, are telling us, are saying, are revealing to us. And and what is our reaction? Well, the reaction of what David, the example that David gave is, though he was not at fault, though he was not the ones who killed them, he still took it upon himself to be part of the solution, to help make it right, to take care of Abiathar. But that's not it. That's not the all of this story. If only, if only this Bible story was so cut and dry and so simple because the Bible never is. There's more to it. Why? Those priests that were slain, they are descendants of Eli. Back in chapter 2 of 1 Samuel, they are the sons of sons, I'm not sure what generation, but they are his descendants. And God, back in chapter 2, had foretold the destruction of Eli's descendants, of his sons, of his descendants, again, because, because his two sons had disgraced the altar of the Lord. They had forsaken their duties as priests, and they themselves had been oppressors of the people of God corrupting their duty as mediators between God and the people of Israel. And because of that, God had said, your line will be cut off to Eli. And here we see the fulfillment of what God said there. Now, this is really hard, right? Because this brings up a whole lot of questions of, so did God want that to happen to God, make that happen. And there's a resounding no. We see this in verse 52. God considers what was happened there, the murder of all of these priests to be evil. And yet, even in the evil actions of humanity, God's will still prevails. His plan, his purpose, what he has set forth still happens. Now, this brings up some really hard questions, right? This can bring up the questions of, of, of different things that have happened in our own lives, of, of terrible, tragic, perhaps evil things that have happened, and wondering, 
if God's will prevails even through those evil, evil actions, did he mean for that to happen? Is, is that him doing that? Did he cause that? Did he design that? And I can't address every one of those questions because each and every one of those are very personalized. And so what I want to say to that is I want to talk with you about those. If you're struggling, if you're wrestling, if those are things that are coming to your mind right now, I would love to sit down with you and to process them with you. I may not have answers But allow me to stand alongside you to talk through those things. Or one of the others of elders here or other members here at Christ Church. We have some very wonderful men and women who want to be in the community and standing and working and walking alongside you as we process the strife and the evil and the sin of the world. But the thing that I do want to emphasize here of what happened there, of what we just described, is that even when evil people, when an evil man in Saul was using all of his power to do what he wanted to do to try to affect the result that he wanted, even then he could not go against the plan and the will and the designs of God. God was still in control. And so as we are being challenged right now to consider, consider the state of the world, consider the things and and the systems that have been put in place that have oppressed our brothers and sisters, to consider the effects of a pandemic and how we can care for and love our neighbors, To know that whatever is happening, though there are evil things that happen, though there is sin that rears its ugly head and exposes itself, that causes corruption and suffering and despair, God is still in control and God's plan does not change or move. And nowhere is that more realized than in what God has done on that cross. That though the Pharisees, though the mob, though all the people meant and intended that for evil, that they killed Jesus with evil intent for their own power, their own designs, their own privilege in mind, God used that for the ultimate good. Such that through Jesus, through his sacrifice, through the blood that he spilled, that all of us, all of us might be saved from the evil that we have done in our own lives. That we might be brought from death to life. And that when Jesus comes again, because he rose from the dead, because he's given us new life, and because he's promised us that when he comes again, he will restore the earth. And in that time, as we hope for that, as we work towards that, as we strive for it, knowing that it won't ever be fully completed until he comes again, but we look forward to that day when there will be no pain, when there will be no diseases, no suffering, when there will be no oppression, when we won't struggle with sin and feel its corruption in our lives. On that day, God's kingdom will be fully realized. God's plan will be brought to completion. And so though evil men rage, though the conspiracy theories are are fast and thick and full and everywhere, and, and though wicked men seek to augment their own wealth and power and, and, and positions of prestige with no thought for their fellow human beings or without considering the ramifications of their actions, God's plan, God's will and desire and his action in our lives does not change. He seeks our welfare. And I invite you, I invite you at this time to seek it as well. Where is the Holy Spirit leading us? Where is Jesus' desire for us as a people, as his people, as his ambassadors here on earth to show the light of the gospel? How can we do that in the midst 
of protests, in the midst of civil unrest, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of being brought to bear fully with the sins that our nation has committed. To that end, I invite you, as we close here, to pray with me. Dear Father, show us. Show us your Holy Spirit. Lead us, guide us, show us what you're doing. And we don't understand it. Why do these, why why are things able to prosper? Why are wicked and evil men and people growing in their positions of wealth and power and prestige? And they do so at the expense of their fellow man. Lord, only you know. And yet we trust and we confess that you have the plan that wickedness will not continue, it will not flourish, that you will tear it down. And so, Lord, do it. And where you see fit, may we be your hands and feet. We pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. All right. <clears throat> at this time, we're going to come together at the table, which I think is another beautiful expression. And I'm, I'm continuing to, to talk about this and pound on this, but in a time in which our, our, the minorities in our nation, which our black brothers and sisters, and also hearing the voices of our Latino brothers and sisters and our Asian brothers and sisters, as they talk about the separation and the isolation that they have felt, that this may be a symbol of the unity that God desires for us and that he puts into action, that we all come together as equals, as image bearers of God, as those in union with Jesus Christ, to share at his table, to celebrate in the body and blood of Jesus and to praise our Father with all of our souls. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after they had supped, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out as a New Testament on your behalf. Take and drink in remembrance of me.